So I just opened my eyes and I was in this tunnel that was a luminescent white, gold, silvery, it felt like a fluid. And this fluid felt as if it was love, which you would consider love or peace, um, joy, that emotional range way up there. And it felt as if the, the fluid was moving through me and around me, and it kind of was me. My guest today is Zach Tavkar, who had a near-death experience at the age of 14. And I am so excited to talk to you about your experiences then and since. So Zach, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on, Lori. I'm very excited and I think we're gonna have some fun. We're definitely gonna have some <laughs> fun. All right, so let's go ahead. Can we start by, I know that you were sick when this happened. So you're 14. Can you kind of back us up and tell us what your life was like before you got sick, before all of this happened? Yeah, so before all of that, I was your average, um, athletic young kid. My dream was to be a professional athlete. I kind of lived my life just trying to play sports and have fun. I had a great home life. Parents were married, two younger brothers, uh, you know, good, great relationship with my aunts and uncles and grandparents. And yeah, that was kind of, kind of a boring vanilla mayonnaise, you know, upbringing up until I was about 14 or it was just you know, everyday life, did good in school, nothing spectacular. And then you get sick. Yes. And then I get sick. And I got diagnosed in August of 2020, or excuse me, 2021, 2001 with uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia. And so that kind of changed the trajectory of what I thought life was going to look like. And that was I ended up having, I'm in Reno, Nevada, so I ended up having to go down to Oakland Children's Hospital in California, Oakland, where uh, they had the resources to treat leukemia. And uh, so I ended up spending about a month down there for the initial kind of protocol of the treatment of the uh, chemotherapy and all the, all that good stuff. Is this something that is normally treatable and survivable, or is this in a lot of cases a death sentence for somebody? No, uh, at that time, the leukemia that I got, acute lymphocytic leukemia, was about 90% cure rate, especially okay. in childhood. This is a primarily a childhood cancer, and there's no really genetic component or anything, so it was pretty, pretty curable. It was, it was just, you kind of had to just go through the process. Okay, yeah. so you want to tell us about your near-death experience? Yeah, absolutely. So that was in August. Through the treatment, I was on this medication called prednisone. And what that does is it can cause osteoporosis and stuff like that. So what ended up happening is my three of my spinal vertebrae collapsed. Uh, they fractured. And so I was having back pain. And so this was October. I'd been in the hospital. I'd gotten out, got an infection, had to go back in for another three to four weeks. And in that time, that two month period, my vertebrae had fractured. So we go to, we're back in Reno we go to a back brace kind of a prosthetic fitting place, a little you know, business. My dad's there with me, my brother who was four at the time was there with me. And prior to that little appointment, I had had to get a bunch of blood work done and I hadn't eaten anything. We get there, we're hanging out. I pretty much was just supporting myself on these little parallel bars, you know, like the gymnastics, you know, just kind of supporting yourself so that he could take the measurements. The man, the, the, the technician was really nice. My dad and him had kind of known each other through music in the area, so they were talking. But as I was standing there, I started getting pretty fuzzy, fuzzy headed. And I had passed out, you know, a few times prior in the hospital from like low blood counts and stuff, which I never really have explained, but in the, yeah, but I, I had passed out. So I kind of knew the feeling of what was happening. And I didn't say anything. I was kind of toughing it out. So my dad and this guy are talking. My brother's just sitting there and I'm holding myself and, you know, it's just starting to get fuzzier, fuzzier, a little speckly. After about 20, 30 minutes, he's taking all the measurements. Everything's good to go. So we start walking out. By this time, I'm, the tunnel's kind of closing in on me. 
and I walk out of the, the, the business. My dad's trailing behind with my brother, still talking to the technician. I kind of am power walking now to get to my dad's truck. And I sat on the little edge, the little lip of my dad's truck, and I put my arms on my forearms. And this time I'm just like, it's just closing, closing, closing. And I see my dad, who's about 40 meters to my left, coming around the corner with my brother. And I look at him as I'm on my elbows and I say, Dad, I'm going to pass. And then I went out. So I just opened my eyes and I was in this tunnel that was a luminescent white, gold, silvery, it felt like a fluid. And this fluid felt as if it was love, which you would consider love or peace, um, joy, that emotional range way up there. And it felt as if the, the fluid was moving through me and around me, and it kind of was me, where I still felt somewhat tangible, but not as if I had a body. Rather, it was just, I was, I don't know, density-wise, I was more light. And then I looked forward and I saw a man in a trench coat. And it was more of like a silhouette figure in this trench coat. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, that's Grandpa Joe, who had died, my grandpa, my dad's father, who had died seven years prior. And I couldn't really make out his face super clearly, or at least my brain couldn't at that time. But I knew it was him based upon his presence. And so we just had this inaudible conversation and what I remember deeply from that conversation, I don't remember much more, but I remember him saying, everything's going to be okay. You're going to be all right. You just have to keep going. And so that was kind of it. And we had, you know, more dialogue. I just don't remember what was said. Maybe I'll find out later. I don't know. But uh, that was pretty much it. And so we had this conversation in the midst of just this beautiful tunnel. And it, well, why I kind of explain it as a tunnel. Recently, I've kind of, somebody asked me more to define it and I thought of it more and it, and it felt almost like there were two kind of densities or, or curtains maybe, but it was as if I was existing in the water and the oil was just slightly outside. So it was just kind of a different density, but the water could move infinitely any way it wanted. It was just that I was kind of, I felt contained in this, tube tunnel like space and where was your grandpa in that there's about 20 what i what i like to imagine is 20 meters away was he so in he, the water also he was with me in the tunnel yeah yeah so in that like kind of water space i guess you would consider it okay. he was in that space with me and um and then yeah after we had that conversation all of a sudden i just felt myself get kind of sucked back into my body and when I kind of hit my body, I just was hearing my dad, Zach, 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 are you okay, Zach, are you okay, Zach, wake up, are you all right? And I couldn't really move my body at the time, like my nervous system was just off, it wasn't on. And I, and I, was, and I kind of just was you know, fuzzy and just, I could speak, but I said, I can't really move, but I'm okay. And then I heard another voice, you know, oh, is, do you want me to call 911, do you want me to call 911? It was just a man who had seen me fall and was a you know, bystander, just came running over. But about 30 seconds to a minute later, maybe two minutes, I, my body, my nervous system started to tingle. I came back online, and then I was able to kind of open my eyes and, and get up. And then I was like to say, we went to the best place you could possibly go to after passing out like that, McDonald's. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> just the worst possible and had some chicken food. <laughs> some chicken nuggets and some french fries and uh, yeah that was not and a soda that was probably the worst thing but you know my dad i'm sure was panicked and was like i just need to get some food and mcdonald's is the closest thing um but yeah so so that was that and then i wanted to tell my dad that but my dad is a worry war he's mr worry war he's so empathetic and emotional in that regard and um so i end up probably waiting a week to you know it's fuzzy but then I, I told him, I said, hey, dad, you know, when I passed out, I was in this tunnel of light and I saw Grandpa Joe. And of course, he kind of panicked thinking, 
oh God, my son who's going through cancer treatment it has this maybe near death experience and what the heck is going on? You know, and he said, well, are you, did he say you're going to die? Are you okay? You know, like kind of panicked. And I said, no, no, no. He said, actually, everything's going to be okay. And I was going to be all right. I just had to keep going. And I told him that I saw him wearing a trench coat and I had never seen, I don't remember consciously my grandpa wearing a trench coat. I was seven when he died. And, uh, so I explained that to him and that was pretty much it. Like he understood. And then my, uh, about a month, two months later, he found a picture and he said, hey, Zach, is this what you saw? And it was a picture of my grandpa when he was about 30 years old, this young dapper man in, uh, in Prague, and he was wearing the, the length. I guess it would be, I guess it's not a trench coat, but I think of it as a trench coat, but it would be like a day coat, but it was a full length day coat and he looked all dapper and suave. And so that was kind of confirmation to me that, okay, you didn't make this up. You did experience this because at 14 right my brain was kind of trying to rationalize this like I said I wasn't deeply spiritual I liked going to Baptist church because I was intrigued but I didn't fully accept it all and you know I was just kind of curious but it was just, my brain wanted to rationalize it and go oh there's nothing there's nothing going on and that just kind of conf confirmed it for me wow well, thank you so much for sharing your story. I always, I always so appreciate when people want to share these stories because yeah. I know it does take courage to come out and talk about them. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, you're sick already. And even though it has a high chance, a high probability of survivability and that you're going to be okay, did your grandpa confirming and saying to you that everything was going to be okay did it change when you came out how you had felt and before you had had your near-death experience that's a good question nobody's asked me that honestly there's something weird that happened when I first got sick I never thought I was going to die from it okay so I never thought that there were moments where I was very depressed right it ended up lasting a long time because I ended up relapsing two years later and it didn't end till I was 21. So there were moments of like pretty severe depression and things like that where I just didn't want to do it anymore. And sometimes I wanted to just die and just kind of acquiesce, you know, just submit to it all. But I didn't feel as if that was the end of my journey ever from the very beginning. Like I always thought it would just be a really good story. It would be a really good obstacle that I overcame and could kind of like show everyone that it was possible. I was always like my little, I'm going to show everyone that I can do it. I'm going to show everyone. So that was kind of the mentality, but it did give me peace of mind, gave me more peace of mind that, all right, just keep pushing. Like just don't acquiesce, just keep driving. So that was, so it did give me some peace, but it didn't change. I don't think I was pretty, I'm pretty, ornery ornery person in general <laughs> and uh it did help me get a bit stronger well that's good yeah it gave me some more resolve i would say that's neat yeah so you said that your grandpa talked to you and you said it was inaudible yes so what does that mean telepathically okay. so there were no words spoken didn't hear anything it was just the immediate communication. Like I understood what he was saying. He understood what I was saying. And that was easy peasy. Why do you think you were not able to bring back the full conversation? I am so curious about that. And I do not know. I wonder, because I, I, under hypnosis, like I, I mean, I've been hypnotized twice now. And I haven't asked that question, but I did get more clarity vision wise when I, um, had that memory that it came back and I could see him clearly. Like I could see my grandpa's face as a young man, which I didn't know him as a young man, but I could see him clearly in that memory. I think I was told by my subconscious in that, that I would get it when like later down the road, like there, I would get it. There's something more for me later, but not yet. So he didn't look like your grandma, grandpa, who looked a certain way when he died, when you were seven years old. Right. How did you know it was him? 
Oh my gosh, that's a super good question. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I wonder if it's like a soul. I think we have. Yeah, soul that's I, right. I think that's all it could be. Yeah, I just I recognized the signature of his soul. Yeah, I understood his. I under, I felt his. How do dogs know that their person is their person seven years later? And when they looked very different after war and stuff, I don't. They just you just the feeling that you get some from somebody yeah. and that soul signature. That's what I think it was. I, he looked similar. He just didn't look like I knew him. I was like, oh, my God, that's a young, handsome man. <laughs> like, look, look, look at this lineage that I come yeah, from. Oh, my gosh. I'm so <laughs> blessed. <laughs> blessings upon blessings. Just kidding. Just I kidding. It. I love it. I love it. Um, when you were describing the tunnel and you were talking about it being liquidy and you mm -hmm. talked about it being silver and gold, I know that this substance I'm going to talk about isn't gold, but it it made me think instantly of like a liquid mercury. You could, you could definitely compare it to that with like, it's like snow. It's like snow, you know, snow and it, the sun hits it and it glints. Yes. It's kind of like that. So it had those other kind of colors as well, but it really but, felt but iridescent, like. Iridescent, more silver gold. Irid iridescent. Yeah. But it was like that kind of mercury fluid but it wasn't as dense you know it was just light it was light but it felt like it had a density in the tunnel and the density outside the tunnel was just a little bit different I, yeah that's what it felt like to me very neat did you happen to look at yourself like look down and see anything i did I, not that i remember Okay. I do not remember looking down at myself. I was just kind of enamored in the space. And then as soon as I saw my grandpa, it was kind of like having deep, you know, having my, my grandpa there and focusing there and then having this just kind of feeling moving through me and around me that I was more focused with. Yeah, I didn't have, I didn't look down at my hands or my feet or anything like that. Not that I remember. Okay. So you have this experience and then do you wind up being different? Do you have any different abilities that you didn't have before you had this experience afterwards? Yes. I started to, I think, you know, many people have asked me that before, but I think there was a switch that got flipped. Hmm. And I started to hear what I call this voice, but it it wasn't so much a vo it was a voice but it was also a feeling and i was in the moments when i was going through the treatment when it was getting really rough and i was getting down i felt this push and these words more clearly than i ever had in my life before it was just like my own rhetoric and after that it felt like i could in those moments of need i could just feel this push and this reminder and that happened quite frequently when I was in those moments um, throughout the treatment but it wasn't it wasn't like I was hearing a voice consistently it was just when I was really low and I felt really like there was a moment in the hospital that I'm writing that I wrote about and it was probably maybe a month I think it was about a month after this and I I, I had gotten a spinal intrathecal which is a spinal tap with chemotherapy. And you have to lay on your side for two hours afterwards. So I was laying on my side, I'm coming out of anesthesia and I'm in this little glass room with my dad sitting there. And he's like, hey Bubba, how, you know, are you, how are you feeling? And I was like, I'm good. And the first thought that I, that I just said was, hey dad, what, what would happen if I just didn't wake up? And immediately he was you know, panicked. What, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? And I said, well, well what do you mean? What would happen if I just didn't wake up? Like I just, like you and mom wouldn't have to suffer. Jake, my youngest brother, Nate, my other brother, middle brother, you guys wouldn't have to suffer. You guys could be free. You guys wouldn't have to worry about me. And he was like, that's ridiculous. Like you're so important to us. We, we would, our, our whole life would change without you. Like, you know, you're, 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 you, you're very important. Like you're one of the most important things in my whole life. And uh, so he left the room and, you know, I think he went and probably talked to the nurse or something. <laughs> it was like, Zach's having suicidal thoughts. And I was having suicidal thoughts. I just was questioning if I should be alive still. And in that moment, I had that voice really push and was like, 
you you have to just keep going. It was almost like my grandpa's voice, but it was different. It was broader. It was bigger. You have to keep going. You're going to be okay. Remember what you know your grandpa said. But this is just a moment, and it's going to end. And uh, yeah, and so from like kind of then on, it was just when I get into those spaces of you know I want to go, but it's hard. It's hard. I feel like I'm stuck in mud. Like I feel like I'm dragging cinder blocks on my feet. I would get that that voice and that feeling to you can do this. You 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 have the potential and you're you're needed, so you need to keep going. And that's what it, and that's what it would that's kind of what it opened for me, I think, early on. And that's then it got been deeper for as a I, long time, right? Say that again. That's been happening for a long time. Yeah, it's and as I started practicing meditation when I got to be 19, it really opened up. So meditation really opened that up and uh yeah, so that was that was 22 years ago that that started, and it's just evolved and gotten stronger as I open up and let go. So, have you figured out over time who the voice is? I have figured out who the voice you is. You have. Now the voice may have been the same. The voice may have been different, but it's the voice now is a little different, and the voice now is uh, they call themselves. They used to call themselves the Council of Eleven. Now they just go by the council. Okay. This is very fascinating. So I want to hear more about this. And you can talk about it in any order you want, because I know sure. that this is connected to your meditation a little bit as well. So you can start sure. wherever you want, but this is so fascinating. So when I was 19, my very first meditation, we'll start there. Okay. Um, read the book, Ask and It Is Given from Abraham Hicks. They suggested you've got to meditate for 15 to 20 minutes a day. And the recommendation was just sit there comfortably um, and turn on a timer for 20 minutes and then just feel your breath. So just pay attention to your breath. As you inhale, feel it go through your nose. As you exhale, feel it go through your nose. That's it. That's all you got to do. If, if you kind of get distracted, try counting. And so I said, okay, you know, I want to manifest the life of my dreams. Let's do this. So I sat there on my parents' lazy boy, put a 20-minute timer on the um, kitchen timer um, right behind me, got on the lazy boy, started breathing, did exactly what they're saying. At about five minutes, my body was almost fully numb. So my hands, when I really deep in meditation, it still happens, the, the kind of everything starts to get numb, starting with my fingers, and it just keeps moving up. But this is the very first time that I meditated so I didn't know what to expect but I remembered in my mind them saying if weird things happen just let them happen don't don't fight it so five minutes in I'm pretty numb at this point all I can really feel is like my chest and my nose the breath and my breath starts to change and instead of just being a normal breath it starts picking up pace so <laughs> and I wasn't I, I, in my mind, my conscious mind goes, okay, this is weird, but just let it happen. Just let it happen. So I'm just focusing on it, focusing on it, focusing on it. All of a sudden, the only thing I can feel is the very tip of my nose where the air is coming in until I go completely numb. And then at that point, I'm breathing super fast. And I took this big exhale. And then I inhaled. And my body expanded to the size of my house. And I exhaled. And I inhaled. And I became the whole city of Reno. And I exhaled. I inhaled and I became like the United States. And I exhaled. And then I became the whole earth. Exhaled. Became the galaxy. Exhaled. And I just kept expanding until I felt like I got to this place where I was in the middle of everything, of the universe, of the multiverse, whatever. And I could feel myself extending outwardly as everything. And simultaneously, I could feel myself as nothing. And I just sat there and it felt like I was in the middle of the stars or something. It was just this space that was, you know, and I just was like, wow, this just, you know, like my brain wasn't even working, but my memory is just like this awe. And all of a sudden I heard this very distant, faint beep, <laughs> beep, beep. And I'm like, what is going, what is that noise? You know, and I'm obviously not looking around, but I'm just feeling this. And then all of a sudden the thought went, your body's still 
at your house, your parents' house. And I went, oh my goodness. So I, just like I had kind of expanded out, I started to contract back in until I got to my body. And then I could really hear it clearly. And my body was completely numb. So eventually the timer just had to turn off on its own. <laughs> and it took about 10 minutes. I was pretty panicked because I, I couldn't feel it anything and I thought oh crap what did I just do to myself <laughs> and yeah you know like I'm, I'm numb I can't move oh my gosh what's what's going on and my body uh started to come on back online the nerves started to tingle again and I could finally move my fingers and I and I woke up going holy moly that was cool let's do that again and so I did it a second time the next day this time I was laying in my bed the exact same thing happened this time I, instead of expanding as I was breathing, 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 I took the breath in and I heard a pop and I was in the corner of my bedroom looking at my body and I just went, whoo, and I went rush right back into my body. And then that, so that was kind of, that was, I think, another opening for me, like it opened and expanded a little bit further as a result of that experience, maybe a kind of a DMT related experience or a Kundalini awakening, something happened there where I was just you know, open. And uh, I ended up channeling on, on accident, a kid, maybe three years later, his, his uh, on accident. What do you mean? On ac so, so I, a friend of my dad's, she had reached out. My dad had heard that her son had transitioned and, and reached out and gave his condolences. She responded and knew my story. And I had met her one time for about five minutes years prior and she said, had Zach ever gone through any near-death experiences? So he said, do you want to explain it to her? And I said, yeah. So I started, I, I wrote to her and explained what I, you know, explained to you at the tunnel. And right as I got finished, I felt this overwhelming feeling of love and gratitude for her. And I just heard, keep writing. So I just started typing. And I'm not a fast typer, but my hands were moving at about three times the speed that I thought they could. And it was just like, da -da 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 and in the midst of it, I could just feel this overwhelming love and gratitude, appreciation for this woman. And so I sent it off. And then she replied the next morning, said, thank you so much. I was, you know, that was wonderful. Can I share it with his friends and family? And I said, please do. But I want to tell you that I think, I don't want to freak you out, but that second half of the message was your son communicating to you. And she replied and said, oh, my God, I was going to ask you if you felt there was any way that he could have done that because last week I asked him to write me a letter telling me where he was and how he was doing. So that was weird. I just and got that, goosebumps all over. Yeah, that was super weird. That gave me goosebumps because at that time I was meditating two or three times a day. I had turned off all media. I was just like really working on myself. So I was just this open channel and it just came through as clear as day. So that was kind of that. And then once I started uh, doing hypnosis, the quantum healing hypnosis therapy, and started to be, you know, with the people that I was facilitating the sessions for, you know, it's an hour and a half to two hours, and being in that space of clarity with them, it opened something else. And so after about my 20th session, practice session, I started hearing this voice very clearly that was not my own inner voice but was very distinct. And as soon as I would ask myself a question, you have that just, oh, what's going on here? What's going on there? You know, these simple questions we ask ourselves. I would get a very clear um, answer to each question. And after about two weeks of that, it started to drive me a little crazy and a little mad. <laughs> and I, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And I was telling my wife and I was like, this is so weird. I just keep hearing these answers. And it was these very clear, concise answers to just, just to open-ended questions that I was wondering. And right? I had these wonders, these, you know, bewilderments, but I was getting these very clear, decisive action steps or thoughts. And finally in the shower one night, I said, I can hear you. Thank you for giving me these, but I need you to just give me a break because it's becoming too much. And their response was, they call themselves the Council of Eleven. When I asked them earlier, I didn't even say that, but earlier in the week when it started happening, I said, who are you? And it's the Council of Eleven. And um, they said, okay, well, we'll be here when you need us. That's it. And it shut off. And so now 
after I kind of shut that switch, I kind of turned that dimmer switch pretty low, it requires a bit more effort on my behalf to communicate with them. And it just requires a bit more um, time of stillness for me and more clarity with like my intentions. And then I'll get it. Do you do it as like a meditation? Because in your meditation experiences, you're leaving your body, you're going places. It sounds like you almost have to be in a different state than a meditative state to connect with the council. Uh, I just have to have the intention. It's the same state. I just have to have the intention. And oftentimes during the day, one of my cues is I get a ringing in my right ear. So if I get a really loud ringing in my right ear, that's them. They told me that in the hypnosis session, the second hypnosis session that I was under. They said, um, when he hears, when Zach hears the ringing in his right ear, he will, um, it'll be us trying to communicate with him. And if he's not listening, we're going to start knocking on his chest, which is, uh, we'll give him palpitations, heart palpitations. Because I had, I ended up getting AFib two years ago and had to get like that, an ablation done and that yeah. all. So, yeah. So that was kind of a, that was a shit show because I was holding a bit too much anger and rage in my body and I couldn't let it go from mm. some, some stuff. You've learned, you've learned a few lessons about how to let, let go of things, right? My body, I've learned that my body is not designed to be resilient. It's, re, it's resilient, but it's designed to be very sensitive mm. and it needs to receive messages. And if I don't listen to those messages, it's going to ramp up very quickly. Whereas people can go and smoke weed or not smoke weed. That's not even a bad thing, but they can do hard, hard drugs and drink alcohol for 50 years and then finally get these things. For me, that wouldn't last you know, 50, 50 days, I would, my body would be like, no, 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 no. This is not part of your purpose. We, this vessel is necessary to receive messages and you got to be more clear and more de deliberate about those things. All right. So can we go back to the council? Yes. Sorry. I kind of glossed no, over no, that. This is good. Oh, I have so many, I have so many directions I could take this in. There's, there's, I, you should see my paper of all the questions I wrote down. While you're <laughs> good. Talking. Okay. Do it. So the council. 11 of them are these entities that are aliens part of an alien group are these ascended masters and spirit guides is this your spirit team who do you think the council is so the council that i know because of the hypnosis session i did in july which where i was underneath and another practitioner was on you know, facilitating uh i entered a room so instead of the the process you get onto a cloud or sometimes a cloud, sometimes things. And then you often have them drop off the cloud to come to the ground, to have a human experience or some type of past life experience or future life, whatever. Previously, that's what happened with me. And I fell off the ground and like landed on the floor, like a superhero. And I was felt so powerful. So I was expecting that to happen again, something like that. But this time she goes, okay, you're coming off the cloud. And instead of feeling myself go down, I felt myself go up. And I said, yeah, but I'm going up. It's really weird. And she goes, okay, well, what are you going up to? I don't know. She goes, okay, well, let's move forward. You've now entered your destination. What are you seeing? And as she said that, I entered this auditorium, this circular auditorium. And it had a balcony, a circular balcony. And I go, I'm, I, I feel like I'm in a council meeting. I don't know. And she goes, okay, well, what do you see? And I say, well, I explain the auditorium. I say, I have a balcony. And then on the balcony, there's these shadow figures with like upturned reddish, orange, yellowy eyes. And I go, and I don't get a bad feeling from them. They're not nefarious or anything. They're just kind of hanging out up there. She goes, well, who are they? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not sure. So I start asking audibly. I start saying, well, why am I here? <laughs> you know, like, what am I doing here? And I start getting these answers. And it was, you, you're here because you chose to be. You answered the call that we asked for. Okay. So all of a sudden, about a minute or two in, as you, when the hypnosis, this practice, as you speak about it more, it clears up. And so the vision becomes more clear. So the auditorium just lit up and turned like a nice white marble, stony kind of look. And all the, the shadow figures became form. And they all looked like Greek gods in white tunics. And I think that was kind of my brain um, figuring out what the heck was going on. So I'm looking around and she goes, okay, well, do you, what are their names? And I, and I said, oh, well, you're, and as soon as I said that, a horde of 
names just popped into my head. And so it was Yeshua and Melchizedek and Josiah, and Michael, Sophia, and there was a few others that, but those are the five that I just keep remembering. And, uh, and so she wrote them all down and you know, I just blasted them off. She goes, okay, who are they? And I go, they're the council. And, and then, so I start getting confused and I didn't even need her to ask the questions anymore. Cause then I start asking the questions and I start saying, well, why am I here? What am I doing? Blah, 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 blah. And they, and so I go, they said that I'm here because I chose to be here. Well, I didn't choose to be here. This is super confusing. And then all of a sudden I stop and I go, I feel like my body is 14 times bigger than it normally is. Like I felt like my, my physical body had like expanded so immensely and uh but it, that was just kind of a funny tangent but so then i start asking and all of a sudden that happened for about three to five minutes my conscious brain just went to the side and they decided that they would just vocalize through me which is very common in that hypnosis world especially and when you're channeling talking. in with channeling Ch yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, per yeah particularly and uh so, so they took mm -hmm. over and then she started asking the questions and they said, yeah, we're the council that Zach was speaking two years ago. We've been watching him where he, where his, where his spiritual team. And so then I start getting, they said, and she asked, she goes, well, she, he said, you, he said, you said he chose to be here. What does that mean? And they said, we sent out a call to the universe for a soul for this specific purpose. And Zach was the first one to answer. So you overachiever. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's <laughs> some bullshit. I didn't choose all that. But no, I guess I did. But she, they, she, they said, um, they said he keeps feeling like he's like not worthy. He keeps feeling unworthy for this. And as soon as they said that, like I start to cry. So I'm like mumbling through these tears, you know, like I'm crying, you know, feeling this unworthiness that I have this grand purpose. And they said he feels unworthy that like, he, he not supposed to do this and it has nothing to do with his worth because we didn't force this upon him. We didn't thrust this upon him. He just answered the call. He was worthy because he chose it. So now he just has to do what he said he was going to do. It's like you pulled the sword out. Yeah, it was, you just pulled. Yeah, exactly. That's true. That's super funny. That's like, I like that. That's super funny. The sword and the stone. Yeah. I, yeah. It was like, he just, he wasn't like, nobody said, take the stone out. He, they said, do you, can anyone do this? And Zach was the first one to answer him. So now he's got this purpose. So just do it. Like, don't question it. Okay. So you that need was... a couple names that kind of like go off in my head. So you said Yeshua, which yes, is I another did. name for Jesus. And I yes. think that as like the love character who is an ascended master. Yes. Is that one and the same? That is the person. And who did you believe Yeshua to be? As soon as I saw him, I knew it was Jesus. Like, what well, I would say it was Jesus, because I knew the name Yeshua. So it popped in my head, like, am I making this up? But when would you, you look, not have used that name? Yeah, why would I have used Yeshua? Yeah, I would have said yeah. Jesus. So I like Yeshua. I don't dislike, but I I would have said Jesus. And um, yeah, but I'm looking at him to my right, and and he is just the epitome of love. Like it oozes from every ounce of his of his presence can you describe what he physically looked like in that <sighs> vision i and it could be my brain but he was um like a like a dark brown like a medium brown hair i don't remember having facial hair he might have had facial hair i just remember the presence more than the than the facial features you know i wasn't super focused on the facial features but his hair was like a like a maybe darker than mine a little darker than mine um you know people could argue with that and say he was black haired i don't know it just that was for my brain what maybe he he wanted to um give me an image of what i would understand that's what i'm kind of assuming and then i just remember sophia having like she was real pretty and had like dark long hair and like who is she? is she? I don't know who Sophia is, but I, I should look that up because I never really looked that up. Melchizedek is a, was an ascended master. He was like a, which was funny because I ended up looking that up and I'd heard that name prior, but he's an ascended master who I think was like an alchemist. 
Hmm. Yeah. And, and then, then you said the name Michael. Is it Archangel Michael? Archangel Michael. And Archangel Michael and Jesus Yeshua were standing right next to each other. So Michael was on Jesus' left. And to see the embodiment of love and then right next to that to see the embodiment of like inner strength and power was overwhelmingly like oof, just the tingles because it's like if you could embody just oh my god a millionth of what those two had in your physical form like particularly i feel like as as anyone but as as a man i don't know it just feels like if you could that's true strength like you think guys that are you know, i'm in the fitness world right so I, I'm always around guys that are big and beefy and, you know, thick, muscly guys. And uh, I like to think of myself as fit, but I'm not like that. I'm 170 pounds. Like, I'm a slender guy. I'm fit. I'm slender. And those two, it's not, it has nothing to do with their physical attributes. It had everything to do with the, their presence, with their spirit, you know, their essence. And it was, if you could just hold like a millionth of what they held in your body, my You'd be, you'd be the most influential person in the whole world. Wow. Yeah. Well, you, you're talking about Archangel Michael. And I think when I've heard people describe when they've had, um, they've had other death nor near death experiences where they've um, had an experience with Archangel Michael, usually he's talked about as being like a larger size than a human. Was he? He's super big. But in that setting, he's taller, but in that setting, I think it was, he wasn't, yeah, because I've had other people that have um, had seen him in their hypnosis sessions and said he's humongous. Yeah, like I've, I've heard five him times. just being like 10 times, like 10 feet tall, kind of like just massive presence. He's huge. And uh, with me, when he was in the council, it wasn't so much that his body was massive. It was that his presence was massive. It was this emission of like, <sighs> like everything is my, and you know, almost like, almost like you could say that sounds like God, right? Everything is mine. You all belong to me as, as, as mine. Does that, Oh my God. How do I say that? Not and it mine. Is, is it mine like as a protective, like yes. I'm protecting you all? Yes, yes, something like that, which I don't feel like I'm not experiencing people like, you know, like when I'm in those spaces, I don't ever feel nefarious energy or anything like that where people need to be protected. But it is almost that protective presence and that strength, like you are mine and everything is okay. Almost like how what Jesus said, right? Like you are mine to marry, like your mind and but with love like i'm going to give you so much your so it kind of felt like that but in a in like a protective sense so it has it been revealed to you what you're supposed to do with the council have you been channeling them regularly what happens with that i can i just am lazy <laughs> i swear to god if i had access to this council i probably would never come out of my room it'd be a tape recorder oh, no well, there'd be a recording device and I would be like asking all these questions. You do have access to this council. You have access to them. You can get there Does too. Everybody have access to them? Yeah, they're just they're just on a different space. So like a different dimension? Yeah, and we can all get there. It just depends on our earnest inner work. Hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with who you are, like you saying, I know, Zach, me going, oh, I'm, I went up there to, it, it has to do with here, like, are you being diligent with the inner work? And mm -hmm. are you going inward? And are you letting go to earnestly move up? Hmm. Right? Because your soul is moving up, this expansion of the soul is inevitable. But are you consciously moving up is the is the game? My soul is expanding in proportion to every contrasting experience I have. Every time I'm sick, I want more wealth or health. Every time I'm poor, I want more wealth. Every time I'm lonely, I want more relationships. Every time, you know, that kind of stuff. So this, the soul, is, it's this constant catch-up game to our soul that's moving, 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 moving. 
and if you're not doing the earnest inner work, meaning like meditation or yoga or the writing or the, the, halluc- uh, the um, plant medicines, that kind of stuff, if you're not doing that stuff to earnestly seek, then, then you're kind of, you're at a frequency range that you just, you can't get there. You're on, you're on 88.8 and they're on 111.1 or whatever. And you just can't, you just can't, your frequencies are not lined up. Okay. That makes sense. Everybody can get there and everyone's supposed to get there and everyone eventually will get there, whether it's this life or the next. It's just, if you're earnestly seeking, if you're earnestly doing the work, if you're working from the, the heart space, the heart space. I watched the video of you saying that. That's funny. Yeah. If you're, if you're working from that emotional, like you're, 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 you're intending to work from right here, this emotional seat. Yeah. And letting this kind of go and this, let this kind of direct that. Yes. So you said you answered the call. I'm curious, you might not even be able to answer this question, but do you think you answered this call because of what you've gone through and where you were in this physical incarnation? Or do you think you answered this call before you even came in? Yeah, I answered it before I came in. That makes sense. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't afterwards. It was before. Like I always had the purpose. And I always felt that as a kid. I just kind of blocked it out because I'd rather play sports and do all the human things. Well, we do come here flirt to be with girl, we flirt do with girls. We come here to have a human experience. So, yeah. you know, that we can't discount that part. Oh, no. It's that's the balance now is like, okay, Zach, you have this human experience, but you also have this purpose. So, it's time to dig into the purpose while having the human experience. Like my foot right now, I've got a little and I'm a vegan, so I don't get I'm not supposed to get gout. But I've got a little bruise of gout, a little space of gout on top of my foot. And the only time I get this gout is when I start getting back into too much of my physical body. And it's my subconscious or the council even them saying, slow your roll. You got to do other stuff. Uh, And what is the other stuff you're supposed to do? It's the work. It's the inner work. It's the, it's, it's, It's being a candle, right? It's spreading the message. It's being a candle to light the other candles. Oh, I love that. Yeah. If if you're not doing if you're if you're losing sight of that, we're gonna slow you down. Pay attention to it. Get on and it's not like I'm not doing those things. It's just I'm not doing them to the point that I know I should be. And I can be. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned before that when, before you, you met the council and mm-hmm. understood who they were, you were hearing these voices and you were just asking all of these open-ended questions and then you were getting answers. So can you share with us maybe a couple of questions you asked and answers you got that really, really stuck out to you? God, I wasn't really asking those kind of open-ended questions. It was more of just what the heck is going on? What is going, why are we here? They well, just said, big one. yeah, well, not, not why we're here. Why am I here? Like, why am I in this room with you people right now or with you spirits, with you, you know, entities? Um, oh God, the, the, I, I wish I would have asked more questions. I should probably well, listen I back to my hypnosis should. session. I actually think this is something you should do. Yeah. I'm wondering, like, can you get into this session because there yeah. are like there's there are people who've channeled like the the law of one, you know, do you remember yeah, yeah. that? Yeah. And they sat down and somebody was, you know, taking the, you know, or operating the recording device and mm-hmm. they had different questions that they would kind of come together and say, All right, we wanna we wanna ask these questions. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I could I didn't really ask those like generalized questions for humanity, which I should, probably should have, but I'm a selfish person. I was like, why am I here? (laughs) Why am I in this room? This is weird. Why am I, what am I doing here? This is freaking me out. Um, Yeah, I would, I guess the impressions that I felt were like, nobody is like, we are here because we attained this level that you seek to achieve. That's really what it was. It was, we are here as your guides because you are seeking this level 
in your progression, in your soul progression, and you are one of us. That's why you have access to us. So go forward. We're done with the work on earth. You said you would do the work for us. So go do it. So what do, you what, think your, what do you think your work that you are supposed to be doing is? I, I, honestly, it's, it comes down to a simple, like, light the candle. Be the candle, right? Be the guidepost. Don't, you know, do what they did. Do what these people did, which was embody that state of uh, practicing, embodying that state of love that Jesus em emitted, that state of strength that Michael emitted, that straight state of nurture that Sophia was possessing. You know, like these kind of things, that state of wisdom that Melchizedek had. Mm. Embody these characteristics as to the best of your abilities and, and, and share those and remind people that that too is their destiny. Mm. So that's, that's a pretty what powerful I, message. Yeah. Yeah. That was the council. So yeah, that was them talking a little bit, I think just now. That's so cool. I love that you shared that with us. So when you were doing these meditations, I want to go back to that for a minute. And you had these experiences where you left your body. So not only did you expand, but then you saw your body. Mm -hmm. That sounds a lot to me like what people have described as astral traveling. Mm -hmm. So have you kind of now gotten into a practice where you've done this more? Nope. No astral traveling for me. I always thought it'd be interesting, but then I experienced it and thought, that's not for me. Like, because I did it and I, you know, I heard people have their, and I thought, oh, that'd be kind of cool to have more of those experiences. But I thought, no, that's not, I don't really need that. It's interesting. It's kinda, I feel yeah. like on a spiritual level, I always say this to people, you know, somebody will recommend a book or somebody will recommend a movie or whatever it is. And sometimes I'll start to go down that path. And then I just feel, no, this doesn't feel right. And totally. I think it's always wise to listen. That's listening to your heart, not listening yep. to your mind. Right. And seeing this resonates with me, take it in. If it doesn't, push it away, let it go. You might come back to it later. You may never come back to it. But right. listening and honoring where you are right now in your process, in your soul growth, in your, you know, in your life experience and where you, you know, are being led thousand percent yeah i think the meditation for me when i'm in a clear when i when i'm able to just let go which is i don't know i say every few months now like truly let go i can have that um what you, i guess you would call it transcendental experience or mystical experience where i'm just empty and silent and still and i can i can expand but not the same way it just feels I don't know. Each experience is different, but it's an emptiness and it's a, it's a letting go of, of this and like this and all of this. And it just reunites me with the source. Mm. And so those are, those to me are far more uh, advantageous than astral travel. Mm. You know, like there's just so much, it, like it's cool. I think astral traveling is cool, but I, I think that's more of that's some people's journey and that's some people's game that they want to play as being human. I don't think that's part of my 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 game. My purpose is not to just leave and go. It's to it's to not that you can't bring that wisdom back with you when you're traveling astrally, but it's to it's to let go, soak it up, right, and then bring it back let go to so expand, soak it up and then bring it back. Like that's kind of the, that's actually the first like thing. Really Almost like yeah. a heartbeat. Yep. This is an interesting conversation, Lori. <laughs> we're having, I'm learning a lot about myself right now. You're a good questioner. I love it. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So you've gotten into something that I think is really fascinating. I would like to learn a little bit more. Um, you're talking about your, you know, your past life regressions. Mm -hmm. I was, um, drawn to Br Dr. Brian Weiss many years ago, read every mm -hmm. book that he and his daughter wrote. Mm -hmm. And then I found a practitioner, this is back in maybe 2008. And I actually had a past life regression and I uncovered cool. two of my past lives, which was cool. super, super cool. It's a really neat experience. And, um, you were calling this quantum healing. So I'm curious, 
tell me a little bit about the name and what you do and how it's a little bit different than what I experienced with that past life regression. I think, you know, Brian Weiss's technique, because Brian Weiss, I've, you know, from many, many lives, many masters and just listening to him, he, he deals a lot with the in-between life states. Yes, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so he has a, but I think it's pretty similar. So the t quantum healing hypnosis technique is Dolores Cannon's technique. Okay. Now, I don't know a ton about Dolores Cannon, but she okay. comes up an awful lot in spiritual conversations. So yeah. people who are not familiar with her, will you explain a little bit about who she is and what she does? Because she's not on this point on this earthly incarnation anymore. Yeah, she. I think she transitioned in 2000, I don't know, 2013 or 2018. I don't know, maybe 2018. She was a woman. Her husband was in the military um, and the two of them, or he started doing hypnosis on other soldiers. And then she would listen in and she actually had more of a knack for it, it sounded like, than he did. So she developed this technique, that a script that she uses and it allows you to not only have the past life um, experience or um, even memories from this life or future life experience or in between life experience, but then she had an ability to contact what she calls the subconscious or the super conscious, or I think of it as someone's higher self or their soul. Um, that's what I was gonna say, yeah, higher self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and so there's a two part to the to the process where it's the first part is having the past life regression where we induce you um, and then your subconscious directs you towards a past life, a current, a current memories or a future life experience and how that oftentimes ties into the questions that you're asking about your current life. And then the second half of the, of the experience is you have a list of questions that you've given the practitioner and I say, may I speak with Lori's subconscious? And you're so deep in, you know, that theta brainwave frequency. That you say yes. I say. And I have you permission. have to do this because I've got to give you my free will per permission to do this. Yes, and it just helps. It helps the. It helps you. You allow the subconscious in. So now you're channeling your higher self. Okay. Okay. So it's kind of like you giving permission. That's how I understand it. It may be okay. different, but it's it's like it's like an it's like an inv an invitation in. And then you also agreeing to it. And so then they step in on your behalf and answer the questions that you've asked and you have a list. And so I ask the question, well, Lori wants to know about X. And then they say, well, Lori did this and this and this, and that's why this is happening. Okay, what about this? Oh, that's nothing important. And I go, oh, she thinks it's important. Can we get a little <laughs> bit more? Can we get a bit? And it's pretty funny. So there's a lot of game playing like that with the subconscious. From their standpoint, the soul standpoint, it's a, well, oftentimes – it depends on the individual, but oftentimes they just go, why is she even talking about this? It's not even important. Like, this is not serious. Like, almost like the counsel with me, like, why is he crying? He doesn't need to be crying. It has nothing to do with his worth. He's worthy. We've given him, like, he's, he came in worthy. There's no question of that. He just has to do what he said he was going to do for us. Like, right. we hired him for this job. Do the job, bro. <laughs> like, well, I, you know, and I super agree with that because, you know, I've shared on my channel a lot that I've had these very profound out of body experiences. And when I'm in that state and I become my soul, I have this feeling of non-attachment where almost nothing seems like it matters. It's, and the word that comes like in, in is inconsequential. It's, I, I keep doing these, like- I, It doesn't feel like it when I'm back in my human body, but I'll tell you that standard. It feels so important. And I understand that completely. Cause like two videos I just released, well, I didn't release them, but as I did just released this week and I'm looking at the comments I like the comments they're fun um and uh so what was I just saying <laughs> oh my god Lori what is happening right now <laughs> we were what talking just about saying? the conscious and the in and out um <laughs> Oh my God, Lori, what just happened? Did I just, I don't know, but I am so super good at like keeping everything on track and like having all these questions in my mind and everything and everything just flew out. We were talking what about was that. Um, we were, I don't know. We were talking, we got cleared somehow. It's that's weird. We got, we got cleared. So yeah. <laughs> I don't weird, know how sorry. we come back and edit that. I, I mean, so I edited it like, to, so let's just keep it in. Order, it's fine. It's the only to fun. make us real. Let's make it. Let's make us be real people. It was the comments. It was the comments. Oh, good. The comments were super fun. Is the last thing I heard you say. 
Yes. So the comments are super fun. <laughs> Getting back on track. And scene. The comments are super fun because, not fun, because I can see how much people are hurting, right? You can oh. see, when I share these things, you can see how much people are hurting and they would say, I would never choose to be, to have been victimized as a child. I would never have chosen to have this mental illness. I would never have chosen for my daughter or my son to die at an early age from, and, and I, and I so empathize because I, I know how difficult it is. Like how many times I've wanted to just die. Like I get it. I understand how difficult it is. It's hard. Being a human being is difficult. But from this, from the aspect of your soul, you chose to be here and it is a game. We don't play games to win all the time. You play a game, like if you're an athlete, you play a game for the enjoyment of the game. You want to win, but you play it because you like the game. If you play a board game, if you make a puzzle, you don't, you're not doing it just to, to like win all the time. Like when you play with your friends, you know there's the potential of losing, but you do it because it's fun and because we every time you play the game, we love the experience and because you're going to get better. You are yeah. going to naturally get better every time you play the game. And it sucks that we have, that it feels so real, right? When, when things are happening negatively, like I just got over long haul COVID. I had chronic fatigue for like 18 months. It was terrible. Well, for an athletic person, that's really sucks. So crazy. And it was, it was just this comp, it was this compilation of COVID, heart ablation, um, anger stored in my body, um, rage stored in my, my body. And it just, it just all culminated in, I got chronic fatigue and I've just recently, the last three months could come out of it. And it was terrible. I hated feeling so depleted all day long. It was awful. It felt like I was on chemo again. Uh -huh. It was terrible. I felt depleted. I didn't have any mental clarity. It was just like, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And my body would shut down when I'd want to exercise, which I loved so much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I get it. It's real. It sucks. But when you come out of that, it's so, it's just so fulfilling, right? It's so exciting that now I get to be grateful for being where I am. Now I get to return to gratitude. And even in those moments, trying to find gratitude to say, I'm grateful for this experience because I know it's pushing me further along my path. And all my processes is to get caught up with where I already am. My soul already is. So it's like that weird game that you're just, it's like a mental game, but, and it's hard. Life is tough, but it can also be so overwhelmingly beautiful. So, you know, that pushing voice that you had that used to come through, did it come through during this time of your life at all? Yep. What it but it was, it, uh, what I would do is I would ask, um, and get need, need clarity in certain situations. Like I could pretty much tough it out, but there were some moments where I was just like, I just don't want to wake up. And I tell my wife, like, I, I, I hate to say this, but I just don't want to wake up. Like, I just feel so, if I'm going to keep living like this, I just don't want to wake up. Like this is not any type of life to live. And I, and so I understand hundred percent and empathize with people that are experiencing it. But when I was in those moments, it was always just keep going, like just keep taking the steps. You're going to be okay. Just keep taking the steps. Do what you know you're supposed to do. And really what transforms everything for me when I get back on track is the gratitude practice. Mm. Is, so what, what is part of your gratitude practice? Well, my practice is if I'm feeling shitty is allowing myself to feel shitty. That's something I've had to learn, right? Not just push through it, but feel the shittiness. Don't get stuck there. So uh, give yourself a few minutes to feel it, embrace it, allow it to be, see if you can get a message from it. Because oftentimes when I mentally place myself in an area of my body where I'm feeling poor, it'll, it'll give me an answer. It'll give me some clarity like, oh, this is a result of that or this is a result of that. And uh, so a lot of the fatigue was um, I wasn't listening and I wasn't letting go of the anger. And so... They first gave me that knock on my chest to pay attention, pay attention. And I didn't, I didn't let it go. I kept holding on. It was just like, I just want to be angry. I just want to be 
and it didn't seem like everyone's like, what you were angry internally. I felt angry, but I put on a good mask. And, and so they said, we knocked at your chest and then you fixed your chest, your heart. So we needed to give you something else because you still weren't listening. So they said, we're going to suck the energy out of you and, and, and to get your attention, to get you to wake up to get back on track. And really that was a really get back on track to being grateful, being loving, being appreciative, like truly from my heart, feeling the actual emotion, the warmth in my chest of love, of gratitude, of appreciation for an experience, for a person, for a situation. And once I got back onto that train and stopped being for better or less words, a victim of my own experience, my body will change and it did and it always does and that was what happened to me when i was 19 when i finally was done with all my treatment as soon as i got on the gratitude train everything started getting better like and, and it lasted for a decade you know 15 years until 2020 happened and then i just got and i just tanked and allowed myself to tank right i consciously tanked and allowed myself to go down there and didn't let myself come back up pretended like i was coming back up and sometimes felt like I was coming back up, then, but just kept pulling myself down. And so they said, all right, well, this, these physical manifestations are a result of the internal happenings that are going on in your mind and your heart. I said, okay. So that was a long explanation of what was, what was going so on. So gratitude, actually, it sounds like lets you start to release those, too. A hundred percent. I think and that's it just, so powerful. Yeah, and it just reinvigorates my body. And I'm sure if it, re if it reinvigorates my body, it's got to reinvigorate everyone else's body. Like, I'm not alone in that. But right. it just and reinvigorates so things, me. And there's so many things we can find to be grateful for. It doesn't have to be big things. It can be teeny tiny things. Simple things. But practicing the actual feeling of the gratitude is the trick, right? If I'm so low okay. in depression or despair, it's real hard to get up that emotional ladder to gratitude immediately. But if I can go from despair to like frustration, that's still a, a, an increase, right? That's still a progression. And then frustration to maybe pessimism, then pessimism to hopeful, then hopeful to, you know, just kind of working myself, but giving me the time to earnestly feel the emotion. That's, that's a hard thing for me. And I think it's a hard thing for a lot of people is feeling the emotion first and foremost and acknowledging where it's coming from. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling despair. I'm feeling frustration. I'm feeling annoyance. I'm feeling, okay, feel it. Where is it coming from your body? What thought is it associated with, right? Because a thought is going to create that emotional response. And then accept it. And it kind of gives you that freedom to let it go. And then I can work my way up and work my way up with my thoughts, right? Well, I'm, I'm happy that I'm, you know, even if I'm not grateful, I'm happy that I get to have this conversation with Lori. I'm happy that I can actually hear. That's nice. It's nice that I can hear. It's nice that I can actually walk and I have like a warm house and I have food in my fridge. That's nice. You know, just playing that little game until we can elevate ourselves within a day maybe. You know, you can get yourself from just, just maybe it takes a week, maybe it takes a few days, but it shouldn't, you should be able to, we should be able to work ourselves up fairly quick. And then we're gonna see the results in our body. And I know I feel the results in my body doesn't it doesn't happen immediately but it, it it comes in a few you know days to a few weeks later and i'm like wow okay this is nice i gotta stay on this path stay on this train that's, that's really experience. helpful i hope that i hope that that helps a lot of people thank I you for too. sharing your technique so where can people connect with you if people have questions if they want to you know learn sure. more work with you yeah, uh, you can connect. I have a YouTube channel that okay. I'll put a link little... down in the, yeah. in the description. My website, I'm in Reno. I do online stuff, um, Instagram. So, I'm kind online, of a so wait a minute. So you do online stuff. So if somebody wants to do this practitioning session with the quantum healing, they they don't have to come to Reno. They can actually do it online. How does that work? It's It's a Zoom call or a FaceTime call. Some people I've done on the phones. I'll be honest. I don't love doing those anymore because it, there is a, a tr there's something that happens. It's a little bit more magical when you're in person. So when people contact me to do these sessions, I always say, try to find somebody that's in your area. I think there's just a little bit more magic that happens because there's a, called the beyond, beyond quantum healing, which is the online stuff, which I also am a practitioner of. I just haven't had as good of results 
okay. people are they are they can go a bit deeper in person um than they that can makes sense. Makes sense. i don't know why yeah for me i don't know if that's other practitioners i'm sure they can do that as well i just am always referring people to to find somebody that at least their first session they can do in person seems to help okay but like i do coaching online and that kind of stuff so more one-on-one -on -one talking but I have done the sessions. I just kind of stopped doing them in the last year just because of the results weren't as overwhelming as the in-person results that I was seeing. Okay. That's yeah. fair enough. And that's really, it's really good that you're honest about that too. I like yeah. that. I yeah. like that. So <clears throat> I'm so grateful for our time together. This has been a fascinating conversation. These conversations feed my soul. I hope that this was really impactful and helpful for the, everybody who's watching so yeah. thank you everybody for watching i'd love to yeah. hear in the comments zach loves the comments here i love the it. comments so, put lots comments. of comments even yeah. if you think of that i say dumb stuff i still get a <laughs> kick out of them i love the comments i got a comment yesterday that said and it was actually very humbling but the person said he's so handsome but I just don't believe what he's saying. <laughs> I thought, okay. I think, thank you. That's like, that. <laughs> that like a compliment sandwich. Like, he's very handsome. I don't believe him. I'm like, okay, I'll take that. It's like a half compliment sandwich. Uh, you know, it was pretty hilarious. I got a kick out of it. I think, but it's true. Like, I, you're, not everyone's going to believe me. And I understand that. And I accept it fully. But I still like the comment. That's okay. That's great. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Zach, for your time and for sharing all of your wisdom with the world. And I'd really love to hear more um, from you when your book is out yeah. and if you do more with the council. So yes. I'm just super fascinated by all of that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a pleasure. I'm very grateful for you for asking me to be on and for having this wonderful show. Oh, thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Next up, check out this playlist of other NDE interviews. Please like and subscribe. It really helps this channel to grow so I can bring you more content. Thank you for watching. I'm so glad you're here.